Hey, everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You're watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. Democracy doesn't happen by accident. We have to defend it. We have to strengthen it, renew it. And I know that the American people are up to this job. President Biden talking to U.S. Air Force members and their families in the U.K. today. What else he's doing on his first foreign trip? I don't know. The White House changed. They moved the goalposts on us more than a few times. I've said that publicly for several weeks now. And um, I don't know where they get to the papers on this. I think that's a big, that's the big question. Now that infrastructure talks with Republicans have collapsed, can President Biden find common ground with a group of bipartisan senators? And they're working on the border wall, but this has nothing to do with immigration. An exclusive look at the fight to keep out water at the southern border. We're no longer building uh, additional wall structure in the current administration. Our focus is repair and remediation of the levee system. We start tonight with the president in the UK, NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli is in St. Ives. Mike, the president's first act of business meeting with U.S. Air Force personnel and their families stationed in the UK. What's he telling them? Yeah, Allison, of course, this is going to be a trip on which the president meets with a number of of, uh, heads of government, heads of state, uh, of course, Vladimir Putin at the end. But this was his first order of business, the commander in chief, spending some time with those who he commands. At one point, it was a a funny moment. They were all still standing at attention as he had begun his remarks. And he said, oh, wait, at ease. He said, sometimes I forget I'm president. So uh, he's still getting used to this on his first trip abroad as well. We heard from the first lady talking about the importance of uh, the sacrifice that not just the members of the armed services make, but also their families. And then the president gave a little bit of a sort of a preview of what his agenda is on this trip. Take a listen. The United States is back and democracies of the world are standing together to tackle the toughest challenges and the issues that matter most to our future. Our unrivaled network of alliances and partnerships that are the key to American advantage in the world and have been. They've made the world safer for all of us. And they are how we are going to meet the challenges of today, which are changing rapidly. So the president there, Allison, hitting on some of the big themes of this trip. But there was also a very personal moment uh, as he addressed the members of the Air Force, the Army as well, uh, when he said that he missed having his son, his own major, as he called him, Bo Biden, uh, in in attendance there as well. Of course, he lost his son uh, six years ago. Uh, these moments when he addresses troops, he did it as vice president on all the times I uh, traveled with him then, and he's doing it again now. It can't help but bring back the memory of his son as well, Allison. Mike, we know the G7 starts on Friday. Uh, What else is the president getting into while he's across the pond? I know he has quite an ambitious, ambitious, rather, excuse me, uh, agenda for his first foreign trip. That's right. Well, tomorrow it's all about that one on one special relationship, a meeting with Boris Johnson, the United Kingdom's prime minister. They're going to be talking about a number of important issues in that bilateral relationship. This is an important meeting for Johnson, especially as the U.K. is dealing with a post Brexit reality in which they don't quite have the same influence that they did as they were part of Europe. And so they're going to be looking for some commitments to reinforce that special relationship with the U.S. But from there, the president will come here to Cornwall, to St. Ives uh, for that G7 summit, Uh, a very full agenda there, a number of issues from climate, the pandemic. Uh, There's going to be a a lot of buildup, though, to that meeting in Brussels when he'll have uh, both the EU-US summit and a meeting with NATO leaders and then on to Geneva. Uh, That's really the highlight of this trip, that face-to-face meeting for the first time between President Biden and President Putin. Uh, Mike, today the administration said that it's sending 500 million COVID vaccine doses overseas. What else can you tell us there? Yeah, the White House saying this deal came together over the last four weeks. Jeff Zients, who's the White House COVID czar, uh, working on this. The United States is going to be providing 300 million doses uh, of vaccines for initially this year, another 200 million next year. They will all go to COVAX, which is that uh, World Health Organization consortium, primarily to more than 90, especially low income countries. The president has talked so much about domestic policy as foreign policy. He's coming into this summit with the U.S. vaccine 
vaccination program, one of the real success stories of his administration so far. And it's all about getting some of our Western allies to up the ante as well. Remember, it was just a few weeks ago, Allison, we were talking about the U.S. commitment of only 25 million doses. Now we're talking about a half billion. So a very big statement that the president's going to be making here tomorrow. And he wants uh, our allies to pony up as well, Allison. Mike, it is it is late overseas, I know, but we could still hear the seagulls behind you, uh, proof that, that you are near the shore. At least that's what it sounded like. Uh, great to talk to you uh, while you're overseas. Thanks so much for being with us. One road shut, another opening for infrastructure talks. President Biden now pursuing a potential deal with a bipartisan group of senators. NBC News national political reporter Sahil Kapoor joining me now. Sahil, the president's overseas, but these infrastructure talks are still happening. Uh, so tell us about this bipartisan group stepping in now that the negotiations with Senator Capito are over. I, I got to be honest with you, it's getting real confusing about who's coming up with what plan, who's negotiating with who. Uh, tell us what's going on. You're not the only one who's confused, Allison. Our team on Capitol Hill has been trying <laughs> to figure this one out. And here's what happened. Biden was negotiating. The president was negotiating directly with Shelley Moore Capito, who was a Republican point person, pretty much on behalf of Mitch McConnell and the leadership team, uh, trying to come up with a deal. They could not reach a deal. Now what's happening is a group of senators that include members of both sides of the aisle, you see them on the screen right now, are talking to each other, trying to come up with an agreement. This is the White House saying, OK, I couldn't come up with a deal with the Republicans. You guys try. And if you can't, then that's where they go to plan C. This is currently plan B. Plan C would be Democrats move a budget vehicle that would allow something to pass the Senate on a majority vote basis, much like they did with COVID relief. But it's not clear what exactly this group is going to come up with or how they're going to be able to resolve these clearly irresolvable differences on pay fors and taxes and even the definition of the word infrastructure. But they are continuing to, to have these conversations, they're going to give it one more shot. All right. So let me just make sure I'm 100 percent clear here, right? They're talking to this bipartisan group. Now, what happened to the problem solvers? Are they t still talking to those guys? Is there overlap here? Just, just want to make sure I understand exactly who, who this is. These groups are largely talking amongst themselves, Allison. The Problem Solvers Caucus is in the Got House. It. The group that, I, that we just showed on the screen, those are in the Senate. The Problem Solvers that includes 29 Republican uh, members of the House, 29 Democratic members of the House. And they came to a general consensus on $760 billion in new spending on physical infrastructure. Now, that is more than what the Capito group in the Senate, the Republican group, had proposed. It is also much less than what President Biden had wanted. So it's, it's, it's almost like a whack-a-mole situation where there are a bunch of different groups talking, there are a bunch <laughs> of different offers floating. And the White House is off. Uh, answer each time has been, no, that's not enough. They want to go big, bold, transformative. And uh, none of these bipartisan groups are giving them that. Sahil, that was a great analogy and great way of explaining this. I think we all understand it now. The whack-a-mole, uh, I think they got rid of the Capito group, so they've moved on. We've got a group in the House, a group in the Senate. They're all still talking and overlapping. We'll see how far this goes. Thank you so much for uh, kind of untying that knot for us. Uh, uh, let's let's uh, stick in the House for a second. Congresswoman uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeting today, President Biden and Senate Dems should take a step back and ask themselves if playing patty cake with GOP GOP senators is really worth the dismantling of people's voting rights, setting the planet on fire, allowing massive corporations and the wealthy to not pay their fair share of taxes. Uh, let's let's talk more about the pressure here uh, from progressives. Yeah, that tweet may as well have a hot fire emoji, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of it. But that, that <laughs> captures how a lot of progressives feel. Um, they are they are very agitated. Um, by this process, by the protracted negotiation, they believe that valuable time is slipping away and that they want Democrats to begin the process of going it alone. Now, interestingly, it's not just progressives who are putting on this pressure. Today, a group of senators that includes some moderates, like Senator Michael Bennett, fired a warning shot to the administration saying they will not support an infrastructure deal if it omits uh, key investments in climate change and clean energy. They believe this is essential. And this is another irresolvable difference between Democrats and Republicans, because Republicans don't want to include uh, investments in, you know, uh, electric vehicles and that sort of thing. They want to keep this to physical infrastructure, uh, roads and bridges and public transit, that sort of thing. So that's uh, it's not just progressives. It's moderates now who are also joining the, you know, maybe these negotiations are not worth it attitude. 
Sahil, Attorney General Merrick Garland also testifying before the Senate Appropriations Committee on the Justice Department's 2022 budget, just when you thought Capitol Hill wasn't busy enough. Uh, could you give us the highlights of that? Yeah, this is a, a round robin of hearings from administration officials trying to explain to Congress why uh, Congress should approve the budget increases that uh, the White House has asked for in a number of cases. At the Justice Department, they've asked for a 5% increase. And Garland was peppered with a number of questions, including Justice Department policy uh, from the Trump administration, including things like seizing phone records from reporters, which is something they said they will reverse. Also, the Justice Department's decision to defend the former president, Donald Trump, while he was president from uh, an allegation from a woman of sexual assault. Take a listen to what Garland had to say about that. The rule of law is what I said when I accepted the nomination for attorney general. It is that like cases be treated alike, that there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, that there not be one rule for friends and another for foes. Now, it is not always easy to apply that rule. Sometimes it means that we have to make a decision about the law that we would never have made and that we strongly disagree with as a matter of policy. But in every case, the job of the Justice Department is to make the best judgment it can as to what the law requires. Now, keep in mind, Garland had been a judge for years and years before this position. He recognizes that courts don't like inconsistency from the Justice Department. They don't like uh, vast changes in policy from what the Justice Department does from one administration to the next. So that appears to be part of what's guiding Merrick Garland's thinking as attorney general here. Allison. All right, Sahil, very grateful for you today, in particular for explaining uh, everything that's going on with infrastructure. I know it's changing moment by moment, so I'm sure we'll be talking about this again tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. It is officially named the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, and it's heading to the House. The bill authorizes funding for science and technology largely to compete with China. Senator Chuck Schumer, the lead author, calling out its importance. That's one of the most major and significant pieces of legislation we've passed in a long time, which is going to have a huge effect on the future of the American economy and American jobs. It's the largest investment in scientific research and technological innovation in generations. It sets the United States to, on a path to lead the world in the industries of the future. Beijing reacting strongly today, calling this bill, quote, full of Cold War thinking. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Frayer has more reaction from China. Allison, that Senate support for this bill is so resounding is a sign of how both parties agree there is a need and an urgency to address potential imbalances in U.S.-China competition. This is the most substantial government intervention in industrial policy in decades. The plan will pour nearly a quarter trillion dollars into research and development to help put the U.S. in a better position to compete with China on things like AI, quantum computing, robotics, space exploration exploration, to be at the leading edge of emerging technologies and for those technologies to have what we'll call American contours. The centerpiece is $50 billion in emergency funding to boost domestic semiconductor production. There was a global shortage of chips, also billions of dollars being earmarked for the Pentagon and Commerce Departments. Mainly what we're looking at is the risk of falling behind. President Biden has said there is a competition to win the 21st century and the starting gun has already got off. And it's not just China, but China is the main rival. And Beijing has poured substantial resources into developing industries here. Now, there's likely to be a bit of heat against this bill in the House. Uh, already some criticism that it was rushed through, that there are things attached to it that had little or no debate, that maybe it's not tough enough on China. But this bipartisan vote shows that there is 
is a consensus on wanting to give momentum to U.S. industries. And a lot of these concerns were heightened by the pandemic because the pandemic revealed or exposed uh, the degree to which the U.S. is dependent on China for certain goods and supplies. So what does China say about all of this? Well, today, a foreign ministry spokesperson talked about it being an exaggeration of a China threat theory. Basically, China's position is that it's up to the U.S. Uh, how to do their business, but China does not want to be used as what it called an imaginary enemy. Now, American businesses have long accused China of unfair practices. So there could be a day when the U.S. will use sanctions against people and entities if they steal U.S. trade secrets or undermine cybersecurity. That's if this bill gets passed into law. There's a new crisis at the border over levees. The Army Corps of Engineers racing to fix massive gaps created while building Trump's border wall. Residents in the Rio Grande Valley vulnerable to dangerous flooding until they're fixed. NBC News Now correspondent Dasha Burns has an exclusive look at the rush to close those gaps before hurricane season is here. The border wall, a hallmark of the Trump administration. Construction crews building 450 miles of wall along the 2,000 miles of southern border until... On immigration, the president's immediately halting construction on former President Trump's prized border wall. Shortly after President Biden signed the executive order, the work ground to a screeching halt. But keeping this campaign promise on immigration has had some unintended environmental consequences. Well, when the order was to abandon the project, then they just left. The day pen to paper tools <laughs> dropped, right? They, they, they just abandoned things and the gaps were there. And we had four very big gaps. So obviously we were very concerned because those levees were put here for one purpose, one purpose only, and that's to, to keep it from flooding. Richard Cortez is the Hidalgo County judge and runs emergency management in the Rio Grande Valley, a region prone to the impacts from hurricanes and heavy rain. Levees that are critical to protecting these communities were excavated during construction of the border wall. Large gaps were cut out, leaving the community vulnerable until Judge Cortez and other local leaders sounded the alarm. Uh, I want to thank, of course, the judge and the county commissioner for bringing this to the attention uh, of the officials that this was important to put this back again. Three months after President Biden halted border wall construction and after a buildup of local pressure, DHS announced they would fix the extensive problems created by border construction, calling out the Trump administration for blowing large holes in the levees and calling on the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who were initially charged with building the wall, to now rebuild the levee instead. So those three gaps, we finished two of the three already. Uh, this is the third and was the most sizable at Chimney Park. It was about 1,700 feet when we started. 1,700 feet. Yep. That's a big gap. It is. It is. And uh, and right now, uh, with partnered with our construction uh, firms that's delivering, we're down to less than 600 feet left to fill. We got an exclusive interview with Brigadier General Christopher Beck, who's overseeing the project. Prior to the Biden administration, what was the plan? What would this have looked like? So on top of the levee system, we put a bollard wall system, basically some steel members that, that ranged in height from 18 to 30 feet. Um, as that was paused and we're no longer building uh, additional wall structure in the current administration. There, there's the politics of the wall and immigration, right? But then there's also the practical implications of the policy change that affects what you all do. So our focus is being the, the agency that executes the direction. Those in the local community say the shift in gears between administrations put them at risk. We have two dams. Well, if those if those dams get up to capacity, they have to release water. So the combination of water being released by our dams, the water coming from the sky, we've had that before. That's not that's no fun. That's that's serious. Judge Cortez says 250,000 people were under threat. So construction crews have been racing against Mother Nature's clock to complete the work. There is still some urgency to, to what you guys are doing to make sure you just get it done as quickly as Absolutely. possible before Absolutely. there's something. Our goal remains to get all of this repaired and remediated. This site shows all three phases of construction. The empty space that was once a levee will get filled with a concrete foundation. 
followed by a concrete stem. In this vertical portion, that protects against a lot of the flood loading. And finally, backfilling the concrete with earth. This is the structural integrity we're looking for. And while it may look like a wall, it's a far cry from what would have been built here. Now, you are, in essence, constructing a wall. It's just not the kind of wall that people think about when they think about the border. We are not building additional border wall. The wall is for water, not for people. That's correct. That's correct. This site now serving as a visual representation of the race to bridge the gap between two opposing administrations. General Beck says the most urgent work here will be complete by the end of the month and that they're already in good shape to make sure people are protected in case of a storm. What does it say about uh, this administration's approach to issues at the border, especially with local communities like yours, that it, it took so long to, to fix what seemed like a pretty massive problem? Well, uh, not to be critical, I'm, I'm a little disappointed. I know that everybody's kind of new in the job and everybody's learning, and I hope they're going to get better. But no, it was disappointing that, that it took this long to, to, to take the action that, that everybody knew was the action that ultimately had to be taken. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce. She has the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Simone, wonderful to see you again. Hey, Allison, you as well. We're going to start in the European Union, where lawmakers are endorsing this new travel pass that would allow people to move between European countries without quarantines or tests. So the free certificate will confirm a person is fully vaccinated, recently tested negative or recovered from COVID. Travelers from outside the EU could get one if they can convince authorities that they qualify. All right. A Moscow court outlawing organizations founded by Alexei Navalny. The ruling, which is effective immediately, labels the opposition groups as extremists. So this means people associated with them can't run for office. And many of Navalny's allies were hoping to run in Russia's elections this fall. Now, the label also carries with it hefty prison sentences for anyone involved with the organizations in any capacity. And a Pennsylvania man, a Pennsylvania man arre- arrested for allegedly impersonating former President Trump's family members to steal thousands of dollars from supporters. 22 year old Joshua Hall allegedly created these fake social media accounts of Trump family members to raise money for a non-existent pro-Trump reelection organization. Now, Hall couldn't be reached for comment. And unfortunately, your Chipotle burrito just got about 4% more expensive. But here's why. The Mexican food chain is hiking prices to cover the cost of raising wages. Restaurants like Chipotle, Starbucks, and McDonald's raised wages to attract new workers and retain current ones. And now, at least Chipotle is passing that cost on to the customer. And El Salvador will be the first country in the world to accept Bitcoin as legal tender. Now, under the new law, firms must accept Bitcoin as payment for goods and services. Citizens can also pay their taxes with Bitcoin. Now, this change will take effect in 90 days. And finally, around one in five Gen Z young adults do not identify as straight, according to a recent Ipso survey. That's double the overall, overall population where around 9% of respondents identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, pansexual, omnisexual, or asexual. Allison, that'll do it for me today. I'll send it back to you. All right, Simone, thanks so much. Have a great night. 29%, that's how many adults in Alabama are fully vaccinated against COVID-19, according to the CDC. It puts the state second to last in the, in the U.S., so why are the numbers there so low? NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber traveled to Phoenix City, Alabama to find out. In parts of the country, moments like this are becoming harder and harder to find. Have you been vaccinated against COVID-19? No, ma'am. How come? Because I don't want to. In Russell County, Alabama, less than 15 percent of residents are fully vaccinated. It is the least vaccinated county in one of the least vaccinated states. No, I haven't taken the vaccine. But eventually we all gonna have to get vaccinated, but I'm cool right now. 
The county's health department declined our request for an interview on their COVID-19 vaccination efforts, but said they suspect that a number of Russell County residents have gone to Georgia, which adjoins Russell County for vaccines, as that is a hub for the county's medical care. And they say those are numbers they do not have. But those on the ground say even that may be slowing down. Maggie Okeke is a pharmacist in Columbus, Georgia, barely three miles from Russell's county seat, Phoenix City. Recently, I haven't seen anybody from Alabama. In Phoenix City, the reasons people gave us for not getting vaccinated varied. I just feel like mm, we so worried about what's going on in the world, but not too much focus on God. And that's what the problem is. I don't trust it. I'm sorry, but I just don't. I don't know. I'm kind of like a conspiracy theorist. You know, I be thinking about stuff like that. But yeah. Those who have rolled up their sleeves say they're not surprised to see so much hesitancy in the place they call home. At first, it was a struggle um, because this is new. So it was like, um, we really don't even know what this is. After it being around for a while, it's like, it becomes common sense. They're really, some people are really and truly opposed to it. Um, I, I don't know, I don't know really why, other than some people feel they're conspiracy people, you know, that it's, you know, the Chinese trying to take over. One of the state's top health officials says vaccines are readily available to anyone who wants it. At this point, she believes the problem is misinformation. We do believe there still remains to be hesitancy as a result of persons having misinformation, really not listening to the information that has been provided and is being provided by medical professionals, COVID will find a place. So we absolutely need to get our rates much higher. President Joe Biden wants to see 70% of American adults with one shot by July 4th. Dr. Karen Lander says as much as she wishes it would happen, there is no way that happens in Alabama. The state is only at 46%. We will not get to 70%. And I think we have to realistically look at bumping our numbers up in increments. Antonio Lyles got vaccinated in late April after his mother, Catherine Ann Brundage, died because of COVID-19. When did you get vaccinated? Two days after my mom passed. She passed the 21st. I got a appointment the 22nd, got vaccinated the 23rd. Would you have gotten vaccinated if? I don't know. But I know that definitely pushed me towards getting the vaccination. When she got sick, she was about to get vaccinated, right? Yes. How soon was that? She got sick that Thursday. She had an appointment that t following Tuesday. Catherine owned this restaurant. She and the food she made were loved. She was a real family person, real family were in it. And, uh, she just loved people. That's what made it so good here at the restaurant. She loved people. He told us vaccines are a personal choice, but one worth considering. And to those who still question the existence of the virus. COVID is real. It can be fatal. And in our case, it will fail. Delta variant of the coronavirus. That's the variant first detected in India. Could be creating new problems for the U.S. Health officials saying that we need to get people and especially kids vaccinated before Delta becomes the dominant variant in the U.S. Here's NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk. Allison, Moderna and Pfizer say they are in the final stages of testing their vaccine on children five and older. As early as this fall, the FDA could have the data. That's around the time that classrooms open up with parents eager for a normal school year. If the final vaccine trials go well, it won't be long before every American, even the smallest among us, will be eligible for the shot. Yeah. Drug company Pfizer yeah. announcing it has moved to the next so testing great. phase for children ages 5 to 11. The trial will include 4,500 participants in the U.S. and Europe. Stanford Medicine is one of 90 clinical sites. Among the factors being tested is the size of the dose. The children sometimes require a lower doses of vaccines, not just COVID vaccines, but others as well, in order to achieve the same or even better immune responses. The vaccine approval news comes as a troubling variant first discovered in India is spreading rapidly around the world. In the UK, the Delta variant is the rapidly emerging as the dominant variant. We cannot let that happen in the United States. 
The Delta variant now accounts for 60% of the new cases in the UK. Experts believe it is the most infectious yet and may be associated with an increase in severity, according to the White House. It makes up more than 6% of the U.S. cases. The best defense? That vaccine. Get vaccinated. Particularly if you've had your first dose, make sure you get that second dose. And for those who have been not vaccinated yet, please get vaccinated. Dr. Fauci announced that Washington has become the 13th state where more than 70 percent of adults have received one dose. And the vaccination numbers aren't the only thing getting high there. A new incentive offers joints for jabs. For a tamer treat, there's free ice cream in Seattle. With the help of incentives and a push to make vaccines more accessible across the country, half of U.S. adults are now fully vaccinated. A great start, the White House says, but still not good enough to reach at least one dose for 70 percent of adults by July 4th. The numbers across the country are looking really good. The CDC director says that case numbers have dropped 94 percent since the peak in January. Infectious disease physician and St. Louis Board of Health member, Dr. Maddie Schlatter-Shueo Davis joins me now. I haven't seen you in a while, friend. It's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, but Great we got to talk about something serious, this Delta variant that Steph Gosk mentioned. It ravaged India. It's causing a lot of problems in the U.K. right now. We're worried about it here in the U.S. What sets it apart from the other strains of the coronavirus? And how does it hold up against the vaccines we have in the U.S.? What should we be worried about here? So it's reminiscent of the South African strain. You remember when we first started talking about that at the end of last year, beginning of this year, it was how highly transmissible it was and how it had these immune evasion properties, meaning even against the best vaccines, it seemed to not have as much e efficacy as we were otherwise seeing. So this is what we're seeing again, um, but at, at, at alarming rates in the UK and also in India. Um, we're seeing it at um, just over 6% of sequence cases here, and we anticipate that number to peak and to take over from most sequences um, by the end of July, which is very concerning considering how much more transmissible it is and, again, um, how it has some of these immune evasion properties. Now, that being said, there's two striking mm -hmm. things that people need to understand about this when you talk about vaccines and their protection against it. If you take both shots of the vaccine, preliminary studies show that it is over 85% effective, even against this very worrisome Delta variant. However, if you only take one shot and don't come back for that second dose, under what absolutely too low of a protection there. And of course, if you're not vaccinated, you are at risk. And so here in the U.S., we're not nearly at the numbers that we need to be. But there is a really a big discrepancy, as you know, um, across states as to how well people are vaccinated and, and, and at what rate we're able to do that. And I'm very worried here about the conservative South, where those vaccination numbers, as you just showed, are just too low. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about states like Alabama where they're having trouble getting to 30 percent. And you said it there, Dr. Davis. I think it's worth repeating. You've got to go back for that second shot. One shot isn't going to do it against that variant, is it? That's it. That's exactly it, Allison. It's two shots must happen. Don't get complacent. Don't get busy. Make this a priority. Dr. Fauci was on Meet the Press today talking about getting more vaccines across the globe. Here he is. I have been very vocal about the need to have a global solution. I've mentioned this to the president. It has gone to the president through the team. The president is A, aware of it, B, sensitive to it and very empathetic about it. The Biden administration agreeing they plan to buy 500 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine. They're going to donate them to other countries. I know the global fight against this virus is so important to you. Uh, what else do you want to see and how how important or significant is this move from the Biden administration? Absolutely significant and key as we're as the president is going into uh, G7 meetings this week, because this is leadership in action. And this is the exact example we need from other G7 countries. A frightening, horrible, devastating statistic that I saw 
was that if you look at doses per 100,000 people in um, different countries, in the U.S., we're looking at 61 doses per 100,000 people. In Africa, 2.4. That level of inequity is absolutely unacceptable, wow. and it puts us all at risk. Summer is here. Airports are opening up. People are traveling, trying to make up for the last year. And when you travel across a country, a, 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 across this 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 globe, and there is that level of inequity, it just puts us all right back at risk. Especially now, with so many variants in play and this Delta variant, we absolutely can't have that level of inequity. So, love to see this level of increased donation. We need, um, in the short term, the, um, donations of vaccines, donations of raw material. But in the long term, we need to increase the capacity for global manufacturing um, and remove and, and increasing oversight um, of manufacturing. Dr. Davis, I have some viewer questions for you. And by that, I mean questions that our team has that we think that our viewers might have, too, that the things we've been <laughs> kicking around in our conversations about COVID this week. And when we saw you were going to be on, we said we got to ask Dr. Davis. All right. The first one, our executive producer is dealing with a nasty cold right now. She has a terrible uh, upper respiratory infection. Uh, and we were all saying today, my gosh, a lot of us can't remember the last time that we had a cold. And so we're wondering, as vaccinated people are dropping the masks, as they're doing Doing more, should we expect to get more common colds and viruses and things like that this year compared to 2020 when so many of us were masked up and inside and avoiding people? It's an excellent question. If you look at how much we have slashed, absolutely slashed the rates of flu this year compared to previous year, hospitalizations, deaths all down across the board, across ages, this absolutely can be attributed to um, the public health strategies we had to put in place for COVID. Masking, social distancing, this all works because these viruses are all cousins, really, if you think about it. Um, and they're transmitted yeah. in yeah. many of the same ways. And so if you protect against one, you protect against them um, all. And that's what we saw. So there are lessons that we learned. And that's why, you know, my favorite saying, I always talk about a new normal because I don't think we should want to go back yep. to the old ways. I think we should want a new and better future that incorporates the lessons that we've learned. And those lessons is how we can better uh, protect ourselves, protect those we love against other respiratory viruses that have been with us for decades now, and that includes flu. So sure, if we decide to drop everything, not learn any lessons, not realize how important um, hand hygiene and social distancing and especially masking um, have been in this fight, we will go back to mm -hmm. those pre-COVID numbers. But my hope is that we have learned these lessons and that we will implement them going mm -hmm. forward. Dr. Davis, I have to say, uh, knock on wood, because I don't want to jinx myself, but I haven't had a, a nasty, you know, one of those winter colds in over a year. I might just stick with the mask next year to avoid those, because I didn't miss that one bit at all. It, it might have been one of the uh, silver linings uh, of this pandemic. Uh, the, the last question, this one is purely selfish. Uh, this one's from me. Uh, the Foo Fighters, my favorite band on the planet, uh, announced a show at Madison Square Garden this weekend. This is the first concert at MSG in more than a year. And my first thought was, oh, my gosh, I would die to go to that. And then my second thought was, oh, my gosh, am I going to die if I go to that? And so my question is for you, it just felt to me, uh, I still feel like it's unsafe to go uh, to full indoor concerts. And I'm fully vaccinated. So I got to ask the doctor, is this a good idea, a bad idea? What do you think? It's a difficult idea because there's things that we cannot regulate yeah. yet. So for me, this is premature. And let me tell you why. You have to have a solid understanding of case positivity rates where you're having these concerts. So if that case positivity rate is well below five, that's a great first step. But beyond that, when you're having an indoor concert with that many people involved, how can you tell who's been vaccinated and who hasn't? And are you going right. to make man asking uh, mandatory? If masking is mandatory, then that question goes out the window and possibly sure we can start to slowly engage in some of these activities. But if you cannot make sure that every person is going to be masked, if you cannot um, ascertain who has been vaccinated and who hasn't, and certainly if you haven't paid attention to those case positivity rates, it is absolutely too soon to be doing these things. And not all places are created equal. 
equal, right? It depends on how folks are doing with their vaccination rates in those states too. So it's it's difficult because we all want it and the weather calls for it, right? It's time. I mean, for me, if a Beyonce, um, you know, called for a concert right now, it would take everything in me to, to not go. So I completely understand what you're saying, Allison, but it just depends on what procedures are being taken, how are they handling these things? And if you're in, if they're not able to make those types of protections and assertions, then it is too early. And maybe Dr. Davis, when Beyonce calls, will go if she does it outside. <laughs> Seems like at least a safer <laughs> option to me. Thank you so much uh, for the good advice. I'm, I'm going to skip the concert. Uh, I, I was kind of thinking you might say that. Great to see you. We'll catch up with you soon. Great to see you, Allison. Uh, outdoor Beyonce, you and I front row will be there. Take care. With martinis, I'm in. <laughs> Police are still trying to figure out what caused a deadly bus crash near Tijuana, Mexico. At least seven people were killed in that overnight accident. Dozens more injured. NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas has the latest from Mexico. Allison, uh, thanks to footage that we were able to recover from a security camera across the street, we now know how this accident happened uh, and how the bus went across the road and landed in the ditch uh, right behind me. You can still see some debris. There's glass and there's also seats. That's the area where the bus tipped and fell into the ditch. Uh, the first uh, information says that at least seven uh, people lost their life in the accident, uh, 34 wounded, and of those, six in serious condition. Uh, earlier today, we were able to speak to one of the survivors who was taken to the hospital. She says she fractured her arm and with a cast in her arm, she returned with her family to try to recover her purse and some other personal items that were left at the scene. Uh, as we spoke, she talked about her co-workers that were on the bus with her. Uh, she says they had gone on a recreational day. These are all workers from a local restaurant in uh, Rosarito. This is a town just north of us, a popular tourist destination for American Americans across the border uh, into Mexico. And uh, they were just having fun returning from that trip last night when this terrible accident happened. Uh, she says she doesn't remember much of how uh, she was able to get out of the bus, but she, she did hear a lot of people crying, others breaking the windows, and somehow she was rescued and taken to a hospital. So just a horrific scene here. Also, the uh, mayor of Rosarito spoke on social media saying there is just no words to mitigate what's happened, sending a message uh, to the families of those that lost their lives and also those that are still uh, in a hospital. And we're still waiting on new updates uh, from the six people that we know were taken to a hospital in serious condition. Police did not clear protesters out of D.C.'s Lafayette Park so President Trump could pose for pictures. That's according to a new report out today. You remember the controversial pic of Trump holding the Bible in front of St. John's Church last June while federal police violently broke up the George Floyd demonstrations? Well, the Interior Department's inspector general is now saying that federal police cleared out the protests so a contractor could install fencing. NBC News national security correspondent Ken Delanian joining me now. Ken, a lot of people scratch in their heads uh, about this one. What else does this report say? Well, Allison, it essentially says that what we thought we knew about that day is not supported by the evidence. And this report goes into a lot of interviews and gathered emails and internal message trafficking. Um, the inspector general of the Interior Department was looking at the role of the park police, which led that operation, and found that the park police actually planned to clear that park hours before there was any notion that President Trump was going to do a walkthrough and a photo op. And they were doing it, it sounds anodyne, this contractor in the fence thing. The idea was to get the protesters out of there and away from the White House and then build a fence so they couldn't get back because there had been violence. 49 park police officers had been injured in the preceding two days. The thing is, though, at the time that the police essentially attacked, our own Garrett Hake was there and he reports that there, there was no violent protests happening at that moment. And that remains controversial. And I should say, Allison, that this report does not um, condone what the police did there. The whole idea here was to look yeah. at whether it was lawful and whether it happened because Trump wanted it to happen. And he found that those two, two things were coincidental. The park police were already clearing the park when President Trump decided to do his photo op, Allison, according to this report. So, Ken, how about a, a former attorney general Bill Barr's role in this? What's this report saying about him? That's a very interesting aspect. We've all seen the video. Barr personally went down there, remember, at the beginning of this operation. And a lot of people had reported that Barr ordered this to happen. What this report says is that Barr was walking down into the park. He met with the park police commander and he told 
the park police commander, or actually he, he asked, why aren't these people gone? You know, the president of the United States is coming down here. And that was the first the park police learned of this, according to the report. And his and this commander's response was, are you freaking kidding me? Um, and so that can be seen as Bill Barr trying to speed up uh, the clearing of that park. But what the report says and what the inspector general told me is that there's no evidence that the park police did anything differently because of what Barr said. They were already uh, in the process of engaging with protesters and they went ahead and cleared the park. Now, he does fault there were like six law enforcement agencies there that day, and he faults the Secret Service for going ahead without warning the crowd. He faults the D.C. police for firing tear gas into the crowd, which was not the park police's plan, and the Bureau of Prisons for firing pepper balls. So, again, he's not saying that everything that happened was fine and dandy, but he is saying right. that it was lawful and that Trump didn't cause it to happen, Allison. Ken, an eye-opening report. Thank you so much for sharing the details of it with us you today. Bet. I appreciate it. You bet. Thanks. The Biden administration quietly making moves to start closing Guantanamo Bay ahead of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby saying the Biden team wants to avoid mistakes former President Obama made here. Courtney joins me now. Uh, Courtney, you say the administration is using an under the radar approach to close Guantanamo. How are they doing it? So it's really the opposite of when Pres uh, he, Joe Biden was vice president and President Obama was in office, mm -hmm. where they had this very aggressive and vocal approach to trying to close Guantanamo. I'm sure you remember, Allison, that literally on day one, President Obama came in and said he was going to close the facility. Well, of course, the Congress got involved and it made it virtually impossible for them to close the facility and move all the detainees out. So the Biden administration, during the transition, when, when uh, Joe Biden was still waiting to become president, to be sworn in as president, there still was this feeling that they would take a more aggressive approach, that they would try to close it quickly, that they would appoint a special envoy, potentially one at the Pentagon and one at State Department, and that they would move really aggressively on this. Well, they learned quickly that it, they were still going to face a lot of opposition to this idea, idea and it was not going to happen easily. So instead, they took this under the radar approach. What they're doing is trying to uh, make as many of the detainees as possible eligible for transfer to other countries. So there's currently 40 detainees there. Right now, nine of them are actually eligible for transfer, but the Biden administration still has to work out all the details for the countries that would take them in. The hope it, by these, these officials is that they would make 10, maybe even 11 more eligible for transfer, move them to other countries, and then they would start moving, they would start dealing with the, the last 10 who are going to be the most difficult cases here because they're the ones who are not likely to be able to be transferred to another country, and they are not likely to be able to stand trial here in the United States, Allison. Uh, so, Courtney, officials told you that the goal here is to close Guantanamo Bay by the end of Biden's first term. Is that realistic? Possibly. I mean, the, the big thing that they're going to have to do if they want to okay. close it, it, well, I guess it's two things. You know, right now it's it's against mm -hmm. the law for any of those detainees from Gitmo to move here to the United States. So if that is the plan, which is it's the most probable plan at this point for at least some of them to come here to the U.S., they're going to have to work with Congress and they're going to have to change the law. It's written into the National Defense Authorization from from years ago. Uh, Congress would have to change that law. And then they would have to find some sort of a friendly governor, most likely a, a Democratic governor that, you know, one of the you would consider is maybe in, in Colorado, uh, who would be willing to take some of those detainees and put them at a supermax facility, a, 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 a civilian prison here. Those are two. It, it doesn't sound that hard, but those are two pretty big hurdles that they're going to have to jump across in, in order to actually close the facility. The only other option would be to somehow be able to transfer all these detainees to another country. And, you know, like I said, there's a couple of them that are just really difficult to transfer. And it, they, the U.S. would be hard pressed to find someplace who would take them that would give them the security assurances that they wouldn't somehow get out and, and be released out into the public. All right. It's quite an undertaking. We'll see if they can get this done uh, in just one term. Courtney, thanks so much. Cicada scampi? Mmm, delicious. At least according to NBC News senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson, she tasted those annoying insects, uh, which are not only invading parts of the U.S., but also being served at one D.C. restaurant. The giant swarm spotted by meteorologists. So this is likely cicadas that the radar beam is picking up. And at the Capitol, one making its way onto a reporter's jacket. 
Oh! Oh, my God. This car crashed after a cicada flew through the window into the driver's face in Cincinnati. But the current cicada epicenter is around D.C. And like a lot of things in this town, it's divisive. I think they're gross. You can find them on sidewalks, on earrings, even on the menu. Chef Sang Lungroth has been planning dishes like cicada scampi for well over a year. For me, it's more exciting than like, you know, creepy or scary. For me, it's like, oh my God, it's going to be my next meal. (laughs) Cicadas edible and audible. They'll be gone soon, the next generation hatching in 2038. But for now, you could say they're all the buzz. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.